Good morning, Grove Church. My name is Rachel, and I want to welcome you this morning. We're so thankful you decided to spend your Sunday here with us. Here at The Grove, it's so important to us that we connect with you. And that's why inside the program you received, you're going to find a connection card. We want you to fill that out so we know how we can be praying for you, celebrating with you, and connecting with you. You can also scan the QR code and fill that card out right on your phone. And if it's your first time visiting with us, we also have a gift for you. So please, as you drop off your connection card on the way out, make sure to stop by the Welcome Center so we can meet you and give you that free gift. Now, check out these announcements. Hey Grove Church, God's been moving hard in the life of our student ministry here. And we're expecting that this fall might just be the best yet. We've got some really exciting changes that are coming to Grove students this week that you need to know about. That's right, starting this Wednesday night, August 21st, we're gonna be staggering our student ministry to serve, reach, and disciple our students as we encounter them each week. We'll be having middle school nights on the first and third Wednesday of the month followed by high school nights on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month, paired with a handful of large combination nights. Now parents, I know this is a lot different than what we've normally done, but you can stay connected through our website, Instagram or Facebook at Grove Church Students, or you can text at parents 226 to 81010. Church, I'm so excited for this change in our ministry, and I hope that you'll join me in prayer for this new season. We're ending the summer with a splash. Join us in the Grove Church parking lot for our summer splash out on August the 31st from 11 to 2. Enjoy a day full of fun with bounce houses and inflatables, free food and frozen treats, and a special visit from Alligator Rob and his amazing animals. Oh, and for children under three, bring your own kiddie pool and we're going to fill it up for you. Don't miss out on this ultimate summer celebration. We can't wait to see you there. Hello, church. Equipping courses are back. One of these courses is our financial management equipping course. It gives you the biblical principles you need to honor God with your money. Did you know that financial matters are discussed over 2,000 times in the Bible? Why? Because God knew this was going to be such a big issue for His people. So many passages talk about biblical, eternal view when it comes to money. Proverbs talk about saving for rainy days, balancing spending in Luke, debt management from Romans, give God what is rightfully His in Leviticus, be a faithful steward in Psalm, prayer over finances and learn to be content from Philippians. This class gives you a biblical perspective on money. Come join us and let's learn together. Grove Church, we can't thank you enough for always giving your first and best. It's because of your generosity that we're able to reach our community, serve others, and share the hope of Jesus. We have a few simple and secure ways to give. You can give online on our website or the Grove Church app, or you can fill out the envelope in your program and drop it off in one of the giving boxes on the way out. Now, let's continue in our service. You ever heard that phrase, there's no such thing as a dumb question? It's not true, is it? <laughs> not true. You know how I know? I know because we asked the Grove, uh, ask me anything. And we made it readily available for you guys to ask deep-rooted questions about how you get to know Jesus or how you know his word or, or what happens in life, what's after life. And you know what we got? We got a lot of questions. We got a lot of dumb questions. Let me, let me just give you a couple, okay? Let me give you a couple. Um, 40 times it said, when does Pastor Will preach again? <laughs> 40 times. So I called one of my friends over at TPD and had him research a little bit. Every one of those came from Shana Davis's cell phone. <laughs> Thank you, Shana. Uh, your husband will be up soon, right? Like we love Pastor Will, but here's the, here's the truth. All right, here's another one. This was literally a question we got asked. If our cars run on gas, 
Why is it when I have gas, I have less energy? <laughs> so let's turn to the Word of God real quick and let's answer this question. I mean, like, what are we supposed to do with this? What am I supposed to do with this question? So the whole idea of, like, ask me anything, there's nothing dumb, that's not true, okay? Um, but here's the overwhelming questions. Uh, how do I know God to be true? How do I hear the voice of God is what we're going to look at today. And here's what excites me as one of the pastors here at the Grove is that there's a lot of hungry people for knowing the voice of God, for hearing and understanding God's voice in your life. And that excites me like none other. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to look at this idea of what does it look like for us to know God and to be able to understand his voice. Uh, the Bible actually says in John chapter 8 that says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That, that's a beautiful passage, isn't it? What this is saying is that we'll understand what God is and who God is when we ask those questions. As a matter of fact, this statement is in, uh, it's Jesus' voice or his words in regards to a question uh, being asked to the disciples. And what he's saying or demonstrating is, hey, the questions are welcomed. Even your gas questions, even your live questions, even when will Pastor Will teach again? All of those questions are welcomed, and we, we want you to ask. So here's a couple things that we've been working on to help you ask more questions. One is in your program, if you're in the auditorium or you're in the chapel and you were handed that program, there's a connection card inside. And last week, Pastor Stewart did an incredible job starting off this new series, Ask Me Anything. But what came from that was multiple connection cards turned in, um, that had great questions, questions about life, questions about salvation, questions about righteousness, or, or how do you live a life that's worthy of the name of Christ, or a lot of these questions that we really want to answer, but here's the problem. On the other side of that connection card, it was completely blank. It was anonymous. And uh, what we want you to do is if you have a question of God's word, or you have a question of, of how do you hear God, or, or what is, leads to salvation, or can you lose your salvation, or, or sexuality, or raising kids, or raising parents, or some of these great questions that we got written last week, we don't have a way to get to you. And we would love for you to rewrite that connection card. Put your name on the front, put a contact on the front, and then let us know how we can search the word of God together alongside of you so we can all grow together. But that's one way, uh, if your questions aren't answered on stage, that's one way that you can ask a question uh, and we'll do our very best to walk with you. Another really cool tool, uh, this tool is made readily available for you right now, is a good friend of mine um, by the name of Kyle, is outside in the lobby right now, standing next to uh, that graphic, Ask Me Anything. Um, this guy loves the word of God. Uh, he loves sharing knowledge that the Lord gives him with people that will listen. A uh, matter of fact, he does this every single week. Um, he goes on his own and teaches in Brevard County Jail every single week. Bible studies uh, and messages to help those men and women come to know a deeper understanding of the person of Jesus. So Kyle is available um, before and after services right now in the lobby, and he's right next to the Ask Me Anything question. So if you have a question, uh, maybe from today that you hear something, you're like, man, I don't know. Uh, I want to know more about that. Or maybe you have a different question that's not spoken of on stage and you want to just ask what's the biblical perspective of that. Kyle's a great resource. A guy might not have the answer for you right now, but I promise you this, uh, he will work diligently uh, to help you come up with the answer of what the Bible tells you on that specific question. So you guys make sure as you exit, um, tell Kyle thanks uh, for working hard in the Word of God uh, for all of us. So here's what I want to help us answer today. Um, overwhelmingly, the question that stood out at the top was, how do we hear God? Or does God still speak? Uh, what does God's voice sound like? How do I decipher God's voice from the voice of other people in my life? And um, all in all, those questions come to uh, us asking, does God speak today? And if so, how can we hear him? So here's what I thought we could do. Uh, we could just ask God to speak to us. Uh, we can say, hey, God, um, we've made our time available. Uh, we've come into your house, uh, and we want to speak to you. So how many of you guys would agree right now that there's something in your life you would love for God to speak to? Speak to. Yeah, a lot of us, right? Okay. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Um, this is just works for me, so let's just see if it works for you. I'm just going to say right now where we are in the silence of the room, go ahead and close your eyes, and uh, let's ask God. God, will you uh, speak to us? God. Will you reveal yourself to me? God, I'm here. Please, God. I don't know why I'm so distracted, God. Um, God, will you speak to me, right? How many of you guys feel like when you pray, that's about what happens? 
You're like, all of a sudden, you're like, hey, God, good morning. I can't wait to uh, hear from you, Lord. Like, right now is a perfect time, God. My heart is readily open to you. And am I the only one? It's like I set my alarm in the morning. I say, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get with God. Because Matthew 6, says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That's a verse I memorized when I was a teenage boy. And I held tight to it my whole life. For the last 30 or so years, I've, I've gone back to that same scripture saying, God, first thing in the morning, I'm going to give you everything I have. God, first thing in the morning, just meet me where I am. Then I'm like, oh, my shirt's not ironed. I'm wearing flip-flops in church. Did I miss a spot shaving? God, what do I have to do today? Like, who's going to be there? Oh my gosh, did you know who's sitting there? Like, on and on, I, oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to be praying right now, right? Or you open God's word and you say, hey, God, speak to me. Like, reveal yourself to me. And as you start reading, you're like, man, that movie Twister was awesome. <laughs> so good. I got to surf yesterday. It was awesome. Thank you for your creation. And like, all of a sudden, my ADD just completely takes over. Anybody else? Like, how do we hear from God? Like, God's word promises us. It promises us that, that we can hear from the Lord. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. This is God's word, like, telling us, like, through the noise, through, through the distractions, right? This is how I live my life every hour of the day, by the way. This is literally, I'm just pressing heartstrings right now. But like through the chaos, God wants to speak to us. And he says, when you call on me, I will answer. I, I think the, the overarching cry of the church today would be this. Like if we call upon the Lord, we desire the Lord to answer. Is that to be true? Yeah, we call on the Lord. We want so bad for him to speak into our life and us to hear him. But the problem is silence is so hard to come by. Solitude is like a place we can seek all day and never find. Like we have this hard time calling to the Lord and hearing his answer. What about John 10, 27? Jesus promises that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Like how many of us, like we don't want to be called sheep by no means. Like there's a dumb, dumb animal, isn't it? Uh, but the sheep to the shepherd, like the sheep know the shepherd, but it says the shepherd knows the sheep. And when they call to me, I answer and they follow me. Like, that's the desire of our heart, is that we would know God. Here's the beautiful part of the gospel is that God knows you. That Jesus Christ knows you. And he knows you to a depth that we can't fathom because he knows who you are in your secret lives. He knows who you are in your privacy. He knows who you are in your darkest hour. Yet, by his grace, he still loves you. There's nothing more beautiful than that. There's no theology deeper than that. That Jesus Christ can know humanity that willingly died on our behalf, bore the sins of us today on the cross, was separated from the Father one and one time only so that he could bear the weight of our sin. And he's telling us that we can know him and he can know us. What about Revelation chapter 3, verse 20? all the way through scripture, it tells us, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. But it's like every time we go to knock, every time we try to start to say, God, here I am. God, like, here I am. We go back to feeling like we're in the Amway Center about to watch the magic take the court. And all of a sudden, we're like at this place of prayer, and we're like, hey, Lord, like, I really need you. I'm broken on your behalf. And like, please, God, meet me where I am. And then all of a sudden, like, Looney Tunes in the background start playing. Things of our past reveal themselves, and like, opportunities or obstacles of today present themselves. And all of a sudden, we forget that we're trying to be in the presence of the Lord. We forget we're trying to hear the one that knows us. But the Bible promises us again and again and again all throughout Scripture that we can hear God. And again, I love the fact that this is one of the questions that we ask. This is one of the questions that when we presented to the church, hey, what's something you want to know deep down within? Many of you said, how do I hear the voice of God? So today my prayer is simply this, that we would hear from the one that knows us and the one that loves us. That you would hear from God in ways that you've never heard from him before. So if I can, real quick, right before we dive in, can we just pray that God would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ways that you speak to us today. God, we pray right now. 
Uh, would we hear through the noise? Would we see past all the things that hinder and prevent our path? And God, would we hear from you? Would we hear who you are and who we are to you? Not who we think we are of ourselves, but God, who you say we are in you. May we hear that today. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Again, that my sheep hear my voice, for I know them and they follow me. So I think as a church this morning, like may that be just our call. May that be our cry of our heart that God knows us, that we can understand him, that we would follow him in all the days of our life. One, one of the favorite stories for me of God speaking, um, you can find in Acts chapter 9. Uh, I'm just going to kind of tell you or summarize this story. Um, but in Acts chapter 9, you get two completely different ends of the spectrum. You get a guy by the name of Saul and a guy by the name of Ananias. And Saul is far from God. Uh, matter of fact, in this day of his life or in this time, uh, Saul has gone to the highest level of courts. And what he's gone on behalf of is he wants to do away with the way. Uh, that's the early Christians. That's the ones that are, are ruining religion, if you would. Uh, they're getting in the way of Judaism, and they're getting in the way of all their traditions and all their practices. And, and they're saying that you don't have to do these things, but all you have to do is just believe in Jesus, and, and you'll be saved. And, and Saul is against this message, and he wants to do away with them. So much so that it says that he stood in approval of the first martyr, the person killed for their faith in Christ, which was Stephen, and he was stoned to death. And Saul stood in approval holding the coats of the men that threw the stones. And now days later or weeks later, Saul's traveling and he's on this um, uh, Damascus way or Damascus road where he's traveling to a, a new sect of people to, to go and really persecute Christianity to its core, to, to silence them, to rid them of the cities. And on this way or on this travel, uh, he has an encounter that leads him on his face before the spirit of God and completely blind. And Saul's only response, his, his only words that he can uh, work up the efforts to speak out loud is, Lord, comma, who is this? Question mark. He, he states a question and he says, Lord, but he's not saying like, yes, Lord. He's not saying you are the Lord. He's saying, who is this? that would have the power to stop me in my tracks. Like, what is this that can take away my sight? Like, who has this capability? At the very same time, the Spirit of God also speaks to Ananias. And Ananias is now in the town. Um, it tells you even what street he's on and what, what place he's in. And the Spirit of God speaks to Ananias and simply says, in his dead of sleep, Ananias is relaxing at night as we should. And the Spirit of God whispers to Ananias and says, Ananias. And Ananias sits up in his bed and he responds to the Lord simply as this, yes, Lord. No comma, no question mark. Two completely different spectrums. Like the furthest answers you can be uh, apart from one another. One with a complete question of who has this ability. The other one that says, yes, Lord, you have all the ability in my life. It's one of my favorite stories of hearing God because I feel like I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I felt like there were seasons of my life or, or times of my life where I didn't know who the voice of God was in my life. And there's other times where I've heard God speak to me and I know exactly how to answer because it's the voice of the Lord who knows me and loves me. And what I want to share with us today is God still speaks to us today, to his people, to his church. And believe it or not, despite who you are, where you've been and what you've done, God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak even to you. And here's the ways he does it today. I believe three ways God speaks to us today. The first one is his word. God speaks through his word. Uh, it's called his word for a reason. It's the breath of God. It was penned by man. We know that to be true, but it was spoken and breathed out by the word of God himself or the voice of God. And he desires for us to get into it. Uh, he tells us that it's the bread of life, that it's the water that we drink of will never thirst again. He tells us it's the life, it's the light, like it's all of these things that give us substance is the word of God. And I've heard it said before, uh, since I was a kid probably, I don't know who originally said this out loud, but it's something that gets repeated quite often here at the Grove or anytime we talk about God's word, it says this, if you want a word from God, you have to get into God's word. If you want a word from God, then get into the word of God. Like he wants to speak to you. He wants to let you know who you are and what he sees in you and how he views you, that you're worth it, that you're bought at a price. 
that he gave his one and only son on your behalf. Therefore, like your worth is higher than any other material value that we could ever have. That he doesn't see who you once were, but he sees who you are in the blood covering of Jesus. And it's all in his word. We, we find who we are. And I want to challenge us. Like the Bible tells us that this scripture or this word is, is inspired by God. It's useful for teaching the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17 says it's, it's good for teaching the truth. It's useful. It's for rebuking error, for correcting faults, giving instruction for right living. So that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Like God's word is, is for you today. There's no situation that you're faced with today that God's word doesn't have the answer you need. I think some of us need to rehear that. There's no situation that you're faced with today that God's word doesn't already have the answer that you need. Every situation, every predicament, every placement, God's word is enough for us. Uh, for the past two weeks, uh, two Sundays, I should say, uh, Pastor Dustin and I had a great opportunity to go over to the continent of Africa, and we were in the beautiful country of Zambia. And uh, Zambia is a beautiful place, a beautiful people, but, but in Zambia, there's, there's hundreds of villages uh, filled with hundreds or thousands of people that do not have the Bible in their own language. Uh, but here's something really cool that got to take place last week. I got to see take place a 21-year project come to fruition. I'm holding in my hands right now uh, the New Testament in the Komashi language. Uh, this Bible was printed this year, 2024. Yeah. The Old Testament's still being worked on. Uh, the New Testament, uh, they do first uh, so they can preach the name of Jesus in this village. But uh, this is along the Angola border. So if you would travel with me to, to Southern Africa and you would go up to Zambia um, and you would go over to the far uh, northwest corner or the western providence, there's a village there called Shangombo. And Shangombo is a beautiful people group. It's very, very desolate, very, very poor. Um, they have electricity about four hours a day from the government. That's all they have. And the rest of the time, it's considered complete darkness. And uh, there's thousands upon thousands of people from Angola and Zambia who live in this one region um, that's just trying to survive, trying to live. But here's what's beautiful. In that people group, uh, Christianity has been spreading rapidly uh, since the late 1990s. And people are coming to know Jesus. <clears throat> and the Bible is, is the tool that they're using to preach the name of Jesus to let them know their sin uh, and that the sin has not made us dirty or perverted, but sin makes us dead and it separates us, separates us from an eternal God, right? And then the Bible tells us how Jesus dies for our sin and now how we can live a life where he knows us and we can know him. But the problem is that's all in the Lozi language. <clears throat> and unlike America today, we all learn the same language here. Uh, in a lot of these poverty countries, these poverty places, men learn one language and then women, children, or the uneducated learn another language. And that's the Komashi. And here's the deal. The uneducated or the women or the children don't have the Bible in their own native language. They have it in another language that they may comprehend, they may understand, but they can't read it for themselves. So it would be like today, you come to church and I say, this is what the Bible says, but you never get to read it for yourself. You only get to hear the word of God through my voice or someone's voice on stage. That's not good. What's good is that when we take the word of God and we apply it into our day-to-day -day lives in every situation, God's word has what we need. And then in our own heart languages, God's word has what we need. So uh, we don't have the video yet because it has to be produced through the seed company. But once we have our hands on that video, I'm going to show you this video of thousands of people worshiping the name of Jesus. And here's what they're saying uh, in the Mashi language, in the Lozi language, uh, in Afrikaans, and in English. They were saying, out of the darkness we come, for the light has come. Out of the darkness we come for the light has come. And they would chant it and they would sing it and thousands and thousands of people would dance and would worship and would celebrate all because the word of God came to them. Now here's where I want to ask you. How many of us have a Bible right now at home? How many of us have a translation of scripture at home? How many of us have more than one? Maybe we have an NLT and an ESV or an NIV, and we have, we have more than one. How many of us have one that was passed down through family members, and that's the untouchable one? You just leave it on the shelf, right? How many of us have one in our truck, our car, at our workplace, in our backpack? How many of us have one on our phones? 
Now forgive me for this. How many of us have those Bibles and yet today have opened them? That, that sting that we feel right there is the presence of the Lord. Because you and I and the place we live in, the beautiful place of America, we have Bibles readily available to us. Yet we don't turn to the Bible or to God's word to hear the voice of God. And I just want to rebuke that in us and in our church and in our families and in our homes. And I just want to encourage you, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much so that he sent his son to die for you. But he also loves you so much so to put you in the, na uh, the nation that you're in right now that makes this readily available to us. No excuse to not have the word of God with us everywhere we go. But may we live in the way where we say with our own lips, out of the darkness we come, for the light of God has come. May we live in a way that we believe God wants to speak to us. May we live in a way today that people like Pastor James, uh, the guy in 2003, he's standing next to me right here. Uh, you'll see me in a tie for the first time of your life, maybe. But um, yeah, Pastor James right here, a South African in 2003, was told by the tribal leaders that they don't have the Bible in their language and they want the word of God in their own language so their people can see for themselves that Jesus loves them. And in 2003, he paid, prayed a bold prayer. He said, God, uh, help us get the language to these people. And it was that very day, that very week, that he met someone from Wycliffe Bible Translations. And that person told them, hey, we're, we assist missionaries all over the continent of Africa. And if you ever need someone to translate the native language into the word of God, we would love to help you any way we can. And James said, just yesterday, the chief and the chiefess of our village asked me for the Bible in this language. And from that day in 2003 until last Saturday, we saw the Bible over 21 years come in the New Testament in the Kumashi language for the very first time. In Grove Church, you got to be a little small, small piece of the Bible going to the next people into the next village. And we want to be the church that helps the Bible in that language and in those languages and to those villages and to those people get to the ends of the earth. But here's what I also want us to be. I don't want us to be the church that funds the Bible on the other side of the world but never opens our own. May we be the church that takes God's word to heart. May we Matthew 6, our days where he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. May we be the church that believes Psalms 119, 9 to be true to us. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Verse 11, he answers that question and says, by hiding the word of God in my heart that I may not sin against him. May we be that. May we be Psalms 119, verse 105, that says, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path that out of the darkness I come because the word of God or the light has guided me in my steps. Hey, you want to be a better husband? You want to be a better wife? God's word has your instructions. You want to be a better mom or a better dad? You want to be a better son or a better daughter? God's word is what you need in your life. You want to be a better employer or an employee? God's word is the desire of your heart. You want to know God deeper? God's word is the only way to dive deep into the person of Jesus. God's word is made readily available for us. May it be the lamp to our feet. May it be the light to our path. May it not be the one thing we hand down generation to generation to sit on the shelf and collect dust. But may it be the very word of God that changes our day-to-day -day life. Crucified with Christ so I can be more like you is the song we sang. And the way we do that every day is by the word of God being alive in us. God wants to speak to you. And if you want a word from God, get into God's word. The second way God's voice speaks to us today is through his spirit. Uh, the spirit of God is alive and at work in all of us. Uh, the spirit of God is, is inside of those that confess Jesus Christ to be savior, uh, accepted and received him in his gift of salvation as the Lord of his life. It says that the spirit of God is indwelled upon you. It actually moves into us. I love how the message version says, uh, that Jesus moved into the neighborhood, that he, he came to us and now he comes in us everywhere we go. The spirit of God, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and the power over the grave, you have inside of you to those who have confessed and believed Jesus to be who he says he is. And to those that are still just checking out this idea of Christianity, know this, God knows you and he loves you. His, his word tells us in Ephesians, no matter how far from God we thought we were, no matter where we've been or what we've done, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been brought near. That's Ephesians chapter two, verse 13. 
And it doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your hangups. It doesn't matter your faults and your falls. Uh, it, it matters that Jesus died in your place. Uh, and the Spirit wants to reveal himself to you. He, he wants to correct us and direct us. Uh, correction's a good thing. None of us like that publicly, right? Especially men. That's like a nature of ours that we can't stand. We're, we're willing to fist fight when someone tells us what we did wrong, right? I, I'll lose a fist fight as long as you take back what you said out loud, right? Because we don't want to be corrected. But here's the truth. Like, the Spirit of God corrects and directs you because he loves you. He desires for you to be more like Jesus. Again, that's the song we just sang. That we want to be more like you. Make me more like you. We can only do that by leading into righteousness and not of our own. But again, only what Christ has done in us can we be more like him. The Spirit. I love the, uh, the word John 14, 26. It uses this word for the Holy Spirit. It calls him the Advocate. And it says the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And I, when I hear that scripture in John 14, I think about foster care. I think about family courts where I've been in the family courts sitting on behalf of children um, who are going through a very terrible place in life uh, due to their parents' choices or due to someone in their lives con or someone around their family's consequences. And now we find ourselves sitting on behalf of these kids. And um, the judge does what the judge does. They, they make their decision based on what's been um, brought up as evidence in the court case. But what the judge often doesn't know is the individual specifics to that son or daughter. But you know who does? The advocate. The person that's placed by the state to come alongside that child, that son or that daughter, and to get to know them. And to get to see what they personally and physically, mentally and emotionally need. And that advocate becomes the voice for that kid. The kid can't speak for themselves, not in the courts, not today, not at those maybe certain ages, but the advocate can. And the advocate gets to know the family members around them and the situations around them. And, and they say, hey, this is what would be best for this child at this time. And it's a beautiful thing that for that kid, that kid probably doesn't even know it, but as a dad in the back, as a foster dad in the room, praying on behalf of some of these kids that's been placed in my care, I am very thankful for the advocate who fights a tough fight, who goes hard after. Yeah, it's very well-deserved. Uh, the guardian of items, if there's any of you in the room, hey, you're a hero to the faith. You are a hero to the faith. Those kids won't make it without people like you. And I believe that's when Jesus says, hey, when you serve them, you've served me. I believe he's looking you right in the face when he says that in scripture. But those advocates fight on behalf and it's tooth and nail sometimes. It's blow for blow and they get knocked down again and again and again. And if you ask them at the end, was it worth it? They'll say every bit of it was worth it because that kid gets everything that they need because of the advocate. I love how John 14, six paints that picture and says, hey, Jesus, he's your advocate. Blow for blow, knockout for knockout, Jesus is taking the beating on your behalf. He endured the cross on your behalf. And now the spirit of God on your behalf wants you to know God more than you've ever known him before. And God wants to speak to you through the spirit. Here's the problem. Most of us, when we think about the spirit, we start thinking about all of this. We start thinking about everything that we've done wrong. Everything where we've missed the mark. Everything that we've failed at. And we start reminding ourselves why we're not good enough for the spirit of God to know us. I don't know about you guys, but I keep track of my sins. <laughs> Thanks for laughing at me. <laughs> I just cussed at you in my head, and I gave myself another sin. <laughs> no, I, I like, I don't know. I mean, it's a human nature. Like, I, it's my batting average. Sin to me is like a batting average. Uh, it's, it's the records or the charts that I keep. And I remember one Sunday specifically, I preached my heart out. I gave everything I had, and uh, I thought it was enough. And I left church that day. Uh, with a conversation. And the conversation was simply like this. They told me um, that the grove's not for them. And I said, oh, man, hate that you feel that way. But uh, why? Why am I ask? And they told me something I said from stage and how that's against everything they believe and therefore their family won't be back. And I just said, hey, I'm so sorry. That's what you heard. I don't believe that's what I said, um, but I'm sorry that's what you heard. Let's, let's meet on this another day. It's Sunday. I'm kind of whooped right now, right? Like I'm, I'm pretty beat down and and let's just meet later. And they literally looked me in the face and they said, no need, we won't be back. That's been a couple years ago. And uh, I, I replay that talk in my head often. When someone tells me uh, the grove's not for them, I relive that conversation. Oh, I just tripped over flip-flop. But I relive that conversation. 
Who wears flip-flops in church? That's why you shouldn't, right? Sinful. But uh, uh, I relive it. I relive it. I relive it again and again and again. And one day, I'm sitting in my couch. I have my feet up. Uh, I'm reclining in my recliner. It's a Sunday afternoon. I'm watching something pointless. It was probably NASCAR. You just fade out, fade in. It's still happening, right? That's, that's a good sport for Sundays. God knew what he was doing, all right? God knew what he was doing. So um, I fade in and fade out. And then what happened was I realized all I'm thinking about, all I'm focused on is my sin. And I have this chart out in front of me. It's a visual. It's not physically there, of course, but, but inside of my head, it's there. And I have all these tally marks and I have four vertical straight lines and then a slanted fifth one and four vertical straight lines and a slanted fifth one. And, and you do that five times and you have 20. That's common core, right? So, um, but uh, I have all these dashes and all these, oh, y'all are like, oh, it does make sense. You, you were taught that when you were a kid too, all right? So quit cussing the system and keeping track of your marks, right? So I have all these, all these sins listed out and some of them are greater than others. Some of them are worse than others. But in our heads, we categorize sin. Let me just be honest with you what the Bible says. Sin is sin and it separates you from Jesus. Your sin might look different than my sin. Your sin might be grosser than my sin or my sin grosser than yours on a human comparative. But here's the truth. We've all sinned against an all-knowing, all-loving God. And every one of us deserve hell and the consequence of our sin. But Jesus, in his goodness and his grace, willingly gave up heaven to come into earth to die for humanity so you and I could have a right standing relationship with him. And you must choose to believe that and receive that. But here I am on this Sunday, not listening to my own preaching. I'm only counting my sins. I'm only counting my sins. And I started really starting to tear myself down of all these faults and failures. I started coming to this realization that I'm probably not the guy to lead the church. I definitely should be the guy with a microphone on. Like if you only knew what I'm thinking, right? You would never let me back up on stage, you kidding, right? So if you knew who I was, you would never listen to what I had to say. And I start telling myself all this stuff. And it was in this moment and just the calmness, the Spirit of God said one thing to me and one thing only. And he said this, I don't keep track of marks. I don't keep track of marks. I got to tell you, I kicked in my recliner and I fell before the Lord in my face. And I started to weep. I started to cry to say, God, why am I the only one that keeps track of my sins? If you don't keep track of my sins, why do I? And the Lord just repeated himself over and over and over again. I don't keep track of marks. And I just want to tell you that some of y'all need to know today that the Lord wants to tell you. He wants to speak to you today. He doesn't keep track of your sins any longer. That Jesus Christ died in your place. And all you have to do is let the marks go. Receive the gift that Jesus freely and willingly wants to give. We don't keep track of marks. Jesus dies in our place. And I got to tell you, like, I wish I could live in that forever, but there's still days where I go right back to my charts. And I start to see my tally marks all over again. And it's in that place where I think to myself what the Spirit of God does as the advocate fighting on my behalf, or John 16, 13, where he says, but when the Spirit comes, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. And I'm telling you, when Jesus told me, the Father doesn't see your sins. Neither do I. I had to believe it to be true for myself. So God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his spirit. And maybe just right now, maybe he speaks to you through his people. May we hear the voice of God through the people around you following and pursuing Jesus. God speaks through his people. Uh, God's plan was and still is community. Uh, we believe this at the Grove to be true, that you're better together. You're better in community. It's why we have growth groups. That's why we take the big church fill from Sunday and try to make it feel small all week long. If you're not in a growth group, you're never gonna go deeper than you are right now. It's where you do life. It's where you bump shoulders or sometimes heads and it's where you sharpen iron for iron and, and it's where you get stronger together with other people who are like-minded all pursuing the gospel of Jesus in your life. You will not make it on your own. It's designed for community that let people speak into your life. Again, no one wants to be corrected publicly. But I'm telling you, in growth groups and in equipping courses and opportunities to take your faith to the next level, this is where the Spirit of God leads us to correction. It leads us into direction. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says it this way. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all 
the more as you see the day approaching. May we be encouraged to meet together. And God speaks to you, uh, the desire of him speaking to you is you would share it to the world. That you would tell the people both here and there of the goodness of God in your life. You know, the other day I got the opportunity in South Africa. We had a, we got there the night before and our flight wasn't until the next night. So I had about a 10 hour gap. And uh, if you ever, a little kid growing up in Florida, there's a dream beach to surf called Jeffrey's Bay. Uh, you saw it on the movie In the Summer. And I'm one of those little boys that saw South Africa in my whole life. I've dreamed of ever getting in the water in South Africa. Little did I know I'd get to go there last Tuesday uh, in the winter, 43 degree waters, uh, like 49 degree air temp. And uh, I got there on a day that was huge. Uh, but I reached out to a local Christian surf organization and asked them if they had someone that could take me to a beach. And little did I know the Lord was gonna give me someone a lot like us, a lot like the Grove. He gave me a guy that's two years sober, clean from drugs, <laughs> radical street kid, a life filled with gang violence, a life filled with so many uh, wrongs that he doesn't even wanna talk about, right? But like a lot like people like us, those that were once far from God, he gets sentenced to a Christian program, a lot like we have walkabout. And he got sentenced to the courts to go to this program. And if he could get clean in this program, he wouldn't have to go to prison. And it was in that program, he gave his life to Jesus. And as he gave his life to Jesus in that church, I mean, all he is, is he's a gangbanger. What can he give the church, right? What can I do for the church? And the church said, come and serve us every day. We'll, we'll give you a place to serve. And he started softening and becoming more and more like Jesus. And it's one of the pastors who said, hey, you love to surf. We live in a surf destination. Why don't you teach people how to surf. And when you do, tell them about Jesus. And now he has this little organization, Cape Town Surf School, where he gets to enjoy the art of surfing and, and get in the water with guys like me and get to surf in par uh, places like Cape Town, South Africa. And what he told me was he said, hey man, if you knew who I was two years ago, you would have never trusted me to get in the water with me. And I was like, trusted you? My passport and wallet's in your car. <laughs> like, I trust you, right? Like, my last clean pair of underwear on a 12-day trip is in your car right now. I trust you. I need those. And we just smiled and waved. And I said, hey, your job, his name's Maverick. You can pray, pray for Maverick. But I said, Maverick, your job today is not to teach about a surf. Your job today is to tell people who you once were. And when Christ came into your life, let them see who you are today. Church, I want to tell you, that's your job. Your job's not to hide from your past, to hide from your shame, to go home and keep track of all your tally marks of your sin. No, your job's to throw that away and listen in the noise for the Spirit of God to speak to you. And I promise you, just like Maverick, God will change your life forever. The trajectory of your life will forever be changed when you put your faith, hope, and trust in the person of Jesus. And then every day we get to hear his voice. You'll never hear his voice if you don't get into his word. If you don't surround yourself with people who are trying to be like Christ, you're never gonna hear from Christ through Christ's people. In the spirit of God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you to those who believe. That's a comforting and encouragement thing to those that have confessed Christ. If you're wondering why your life feels dead or, or distant from God, you probably need to ask, when's the last time you've tried to get past the noise and into a place of solitude or silence? Get there today. He's waiting on you. And if you're still checking this thing out and you don't know what Christianity is all about, let me tell you what it's about. Jesus Christ desires a relationship with you. He knows all your wrongs. He knows all your sins. He's seen your tally marks and your charts. He holds them against you no more. He died in your place. And what you must choose this day is to receive that gift of salvation. And your life is forever changed. If you're in the auditorium, we're gonna, in just a minute, ask you to stand your feet and pray and you can come up to the front. Some of our team will be right up front. If, if you're in the chapel, there's a pastor in the back right now who wants nothing more than to meet and be with you. If you're listening online, wherever you are, fill out a connection card. Drop us a, a, a little line in that box and uh, we wanna get with you and pray with you about what Jesus is doing in your life. And if you're in the lobby, my friend Kyle right now wants to be with you and walk through the scripture of whatever question it is you have. He wants to help you see what God's word has to say for your situation. So if you guys would, please stand to your feet. Uh, let's pray. And uh, you move as the way the Lord's calling you to move. And I believe he'll meet you right where you are. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us, for your grace that you've freely given us. May salvation be ours today. 
God, I pray for the men and women in the room right now that desperately want to hear from you. I pray you would silence the noise. You would turn down the volume of all the things around us that's hindering us from getting to you. And in the name of Jesus, would we hear from the one that knows us and loves us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Grove Church Online. We hope that service and that message was incredibly encouraging to you. Hey, I don't know where you are spiritually, but let me tell you what we believe. That God loves you and has a plan for your life. But because we've gone our own way, we live in brokenness. But the good news is, is that Jesus came and lived the life we couldn't and died the death we should have and rose from the dead, proving there's a way out of brokenness and towards God's plan for our life. If you're interested in learning more about how to have a relationship with Jesus, I'd encourage you to visit the link below. We'd love to connect with you and would love to help you take your next step in your relationship with God.